welcome to Voices, a podcast from the Institute for Human Rights and Business. Here, we are seeking to elevate the range of perspectives on the role of business in the world and in people's everyday lives. Hello, everybody. I'm John Morrison. I'm the CEO of the Institute for Human Rights and Business, IHRB.org. We're a global think and do tank working around the world to make business more accountable for its human rights impacts, but also to leverage um, the the influence business can have to make life better for everybody. Uh, We're living in very challenging times, um, but I'm very pleased to be joined by uh, a friend, um, a colleague, a fellow traveler, known to many people out there, um, uh, perhaps one of an endangered species or or a geological uh, strata, if you like, Children will ask in the future, Mummy, Daddy, was there ever such a thing as a British member of the European Parliament? And I'll be able to say at least that I had the privilege of knowing a few of them, and uh, Richard probably best. Um, So Richard served as an an MEP for 22 years and led a lot of the Parliament's thinking on corporate social responsibility, also human rights. Um, And then after that was CEO of the Integrated Reporting Council, Um, and we'll touch on those issues too. Um, I'm also very pleased that Richard is with me now because Richard has been very sick. Uh, He's just recovered from COVID-19, which is the plague that's amongst us at the moment. And certainly in terms of my professional network, Richard has been one of the people I've been most concerned about over over recent weeks. So Richard, please, please join me now. Just say a little bit about how bad COVID was for you um, and how you're feeling now. I mean, you're looking well, but are you feeling well? And um, if you're willing to tell us a little bit about what you've been through, um, uh, please. Well, firstly, hello to you and everyone at the Institute. I'm always pleased to talk to you. But after going through coronavirus, I'm really pleased to be talking to you. <laughs> it was a, it was a, uh, and I didn't go into intensive care. I didn't go on a ventilator. So many had it worse than me. But I was, I had to be ordered into hospital. Uh, I underestimated very badly how 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 it was. I spent four days in hospital on oxygen, um, and uh, I got very bad pneumonia on both lungs from it. Uh, And I was six weeks in bed afterwards and the period both in hospital when the the doctors and nurses were fantastic, of course, but they were. Uh, But I was very ill, surrounded by very ill people. And it it really was like a medieval plague. We were all just screaming and shouting out and coughing endlessly. Uh, uh, And then being at home, uh, pretty ill, frankly, but being quarantined from my own family, it was like being a, a kidnapped victim or something with food being left on a tray outside my door. Um, uh, I never want to go through that again. It's the most ill that I've been in my life. And, you know, let's just recall that many had it worse and many thousands upon thousands have lost their lives in this crisis. And there will be lessons to learn about what was foreseeable and what could have been done differently. And I hope that transparently that will be looked at and we can all learn lessons from this crisis. It's uh, unique, I think, in all our lifetimes. And I'm desperate for there to be immunity for people who had it. At the time we're recording this, no one knows if that's true, but I'm desperate that I've got immunity and I can go around without having the danger of getting it again. Well, it's great you're here and... um... Um, we've been very concerned about you. I'm mean, I, I just watching Newsnight last night and they had this uh, graphic there that showed in terms of yesterday's mm-hmm. reported deaths, there have been more in the UK than the rest of the European Union um, put together. I was the rest of the European Union, we're not part of the European Union, but the European Union, there'd be more deaths in the UK yesterday than, than the whole of the EU put together. And I don't want to get political here, but but the issue of how preventable this was and how well managed it's been. When you were in hospital, um, obviously concerned about your own life and, and reflecting on things, did you look back at your own behaviour or did you feel angry in any sense about the way you weren't warned enough uh, by by maybe some of the, the delays in government taking action to, to, to protect people? Uh, I was angry. But angry because the nurses who were looking after me didn't have the correct PPE 
and I couldn't speak, but I was listening to them talking to each other and they knew it and they were carrying on doing their jobs. Uh, and that did make me angry and it still makes me angry. And I think the lateness of the response in the United Kingdom, the fact that the protective equipment wasn't made available uh, as it should have been, even though two years ago the government had its own internal recommendations that that should be stockpiled and ready, and they just didn't act upon it. The fact that the testing was dropped at a crucial moment, and that's what's been successful in other countries internationally. Uh, uh, I, and, of course, this whole, for your international viewers, um, domestic controversy around the non-sacking of the Prime Minister's chief advisor uh, and the key to that is not a political one uh, about him and his relationship with the Prime Minister. It's an issue of trust, which is that the people have had to have trust in the government to do some very, very difficult things in terms of isolation. Uh, and it has risked a breakdown in that trust for purely political reasons. And I think that all in the the uh, uh, in time is going to see Britain's record with this greater number of excess deaths, which is the only truly comparable international measure. But that is going to see huge condemnation of what has happened in Britain during these years. And I say that with no relish whatsoever. And looking forward, um, obviously the economy is suffering terribly. I mean, you and me have worked on business and with biz business for a long time. <clears throat> Do you think we are doing it right in the in the pace of opening up and, and kids going back to primary school and, you know, people going on marches yesterday, the Black Lives Matter march in London, et cetera, lots of young people together. Um, some of that is almost inevitable, perhaps. But And then you have um, Dominic Cummings perhaps sending a message, as you've alluded to, that... Uh, um, you know, you can interpret the rules a bit the way you want to. Um, are you worried about a second wave? Uh, are you feeling safe yourself when you go outside? How's it left you feeling about that? Well, my community, I live in Cambridge in the UK. Uh, as I say, I'm building up my stamina, so I'm going out for sh very short walks each day. And it's very, very obvious to me that there's a breakdown in support for social distancing, people on are, are just not doing it. There, a degree of fatigue might be expected, so I don't put that all down to the government. But I do think the Dominic Cummings affair has been a really significant uh, aspect of that, and I really regret it. And of course, if it leads to a second spike and unnecessary deaths, you know, the measurement of that is going to be really quite horrendously awful. And so we all hope that won't happen, but I am worried about it. And now taking the conversation a bit to the day job, um, um, and whatever the world we work in is called, it used to be called CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. We call it Responsible Business Conduct, Business and Human Rights, Sustainability, <laughs> whatever we want to call it. Um, we did a report uh, nearly two months ago now about some of the immediate lessons um, around supply chains and treatment of workers, etc. What, what lessons do you think we can learn from the current crisis in relation to responsible business? What, what are your hopes and expectations there? Well, I do have some hopes. Um, I think uh, we've all, and I do regard it as a movement, we've all argued that businesses are ultimately very connected in their value chains, uh, with suppliers often a long way away, but... Uh, on whose their, their decisions have decisive impacts upon their lives, but it's also connected, connected in terms of the um, results and impacts they have on financial capital with the other capital, particularly natural capital, but social capital uh, with its human rights perspective, and that you cannot possibly see these things in isolation or in silos, uh, and that businesses should understand those connections. And I think... The COVID crisis has done a massive amount to broaden the perspective within business about how dependent business is on issues and uh, um, events and developments well outside of the normal sphere that they would consider. And I think that is a huge opportunity for us. And then I also think we've been arguing and I've been arguing that the key, one of the key differences is moving from short, short term to long term thinking. It sounds obvious and who could disagree with that? But the truth is most business and most of us, if we are honest, get trapped too often in excessive short term thinking. Whereas if you care about 
big issues like migration, like international development, and of course, like climate change, you can only really impact upon those through a long-term vision and a long-term perspective. Uh, and we may well come back to this later, but I think that the, the, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure, and I was convening the major world project to get the TCFD recommendations um, implemented in common by all the big sustainability frameworks, reporting frameworks in the world, uh, successfully, by the way, and proud, proud achievement for with that and for them, not just, of course, for myself and my, my colleagues. But uh, what that experience uh, has taught me is that we have made a breakthrough in terms of the relationship between the financial performance of the company and its performance in other areas, which we might call ESG, CSR, uh, responsible business, or as you say, any of those, I think the differences are much less important than the principles behind them, and you do too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that, uh, and I think that provides an enormous opportunity. And lots of people watching this will have read articles that have sprung up across the media and listened to broadcasts which say, particularly with low emissions, low carbon emissions that this is a huge opportunity because there's been a ma major difference uh, because of the lockdowns and the quarantines. But I suppose there are, I would want to just draw to your attention some dangers uh, and worries that I have because I was, I was present, of course, back in the, uh, in the movement in the aftermath of the 2008-9 financial crisis where people said, oh, it will, it will, absolutely show connectivity and the, the, the difficulties of short-termism and this is our great opportunity but in essence I think on balance although we may you know we didn't step too far backwards but I think there was a major distraction there uh, which put us back it didn't it didn't reverse what we'd achieved but it people became so um, concentrated on issues of banks and bank liquidity yeah, yeah. Uh, that they stopped talking about the wider issues on human rights, environments, and social impacts. And I'm worried that that might be true if there's an excessive narrow focus on narrow definitions of health and uh, medicines in in this next period. And the other big danger, John, that I would identify is that we've seen a retreat in politics in recent years towards economic nationalism, which I yeah. think is very unwelcome. Yeah. Um, but that those nationalistic tendencies could have been reinforced for yeah. for a longer period you know yeah. travel bans coming into countries different yeah. types of responses to the crisis and governments very much saying we know best in our own country and then of course donald trump pulling out of the world health organization yeah. and to the degree that this reinforces nationalism at the expense of multilateralism Human rights are dependent on the international uh, covenant, um, and it's it's going to be impossible to advance a case on business and human rights if we have countries retreating into their own national rules and political and economic nationalism. So I think there are huge opportunities, but also huge risks, and. You know, we'll be working on one side of that argument. Let's see, though, and I'm afraid it will be five or ten years before we really see what the outcome will be. Just, yeah, let's just take two examples of that. Bangladesh. We had a we had a, <coughs> webinar a couple of weeks ago with representatives of Bangladeshi workers and suppliers. Um, I read yesterday that the European Union has donated um, over 100 million euros to support the one million women who are currently out of work from the apparel sector in Bangladesh. Now, obviously, those kind of bailouts can't happen very many times if the if if the apparel sector doesn't pick up. Um, you know, several million workers might be losing their jobs in Bangladesh. Um, what do we learn here? Do we learn that actually supply chains need to be retrenched and and that you know apparel goods need to be made in Europe? Are we going to see Portugal, Spain, Greece, or, or even Northern Europe or North America making more garments in the next five years, or are we going to have um, supply chains in Bangladesh and elsewhere that are way more robust than they are at the moment. Um, which way do you think it's going to go? Uh, again, it's difficult to know. Um, 
I, I suspect myself that globalization are old friend and for some foe but I've, I've always argued that open trade but fair trade has massively increased prosperity in the world and and without it uh we're not just talking about economic fragmentation but physical fragmentation and risk of conflict the lessons of history are there um so i suspect that the gains that have been made through economic globalization are irreversible in the longer term and that those supply chains will return, but will they be returned in a strengthened way? And think of all the work we've done on Bangladesh following the factory fire on the plaza. On plaza, yeah. Uh, you know, it's probably the key example in the entire world on whether companies and countries can be proactive in improving conditions, not simply try to protect conditions in their existing supply chains. And yet suddenly this crisis comes along and perhaps sweeps away so many of the gains that we've yeah. that we've all worked hard, very, very hard to see. And I think uh, there are two aspects of that, that international development, our other, one of our own, other old friends, uh, is really going to kick in here because everyone's been worrying about the number of deaths and the uh, health provisions in their own country. But the, the uh, pandemic is coming later to many yeah. uh, development countries. Look how now it's only really hitting in Latin America. And let's think when it's going to hit and if it's going to hit to those degrees across Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. So there's a huge inter international development um, aspect to, to um, all, of, all of this. Absolutely. Just on the financial bailout stuff, you mentioned the financial crisis of 10 years ago. Mm. and Maybe we didn't learn the lessons we should have done, or the bankers didn't at least. Um, the financial sector is going to have a heck of a lot of leverage over the next years. Everyone's going to be in debt to the financial sector, right? Um, states are going to be in debt. Uh, business is going to be in debt. Uh, huge commu hu whole communities are going to be in debt. Is that leverage going to be used in a beneficial way? I mean, do you believe that we should be leveraging now to say that, uh, that you know bailouts can only be used for sustainable projects or green projects or human rights friendly projects? Do you believe in strong conditionality around the bailout? I do, by the way, strongly as a point of principle. And for those, you know, the argument against it that you hear is that this is playing politics with mm, yeah. uh, uh, inappropriately. You, and you sure also short term futures, you know, yeah. yeah. And you also hear that, you know, they will just delay and complicate yeah. Yeah. getting on with doing things. And yeah. the big, you know, we'll hear people saying, but let's just get people back into jobs and just, yeah, and this, and don't introduce these extra yeah. things those will be the arguments used but the counter argument to that is that no one is insisting that a company or anyone else gets public money they want the public money they need it yeah. and they do need it i'm an advocate for that but it's perfectly proper if money is being paid from the public purse for public interest objectives to be part of providing that right and then uh, will will it happen well, the Canadian government has made environmental conditionalities on the COVID grants that it's yeah. given, yeah. Uh, and that's great, and it sets a bit of a precedent. But I'm looking at major, major investments from the European Central Bank, for example, the decisions of the IMF, and I'm looking very, very hard at any environmental, human rights, or other conditionalities, and other than the, the general... Uh, principles that, of course, we've got built into those programmes over the years, but I'm not seeing that extra leverage being used at the moment. Right. And so the argument I agree with, but I don't see yet that argument really succeeding. Okay, well, maybe. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, just going on a bit to your experience as an MEP 22 years <coughs> and uh, that geological strata which you, you occupied. Um, um, you know, CSR... 22 years ago was seen as a voluntary thing. Um, mm. Europe even defined it in voluntary terms. And I mean, part of your struggle and my struggle and many others was to try and harden that. Um, it seems that somehow we've reached a kind of tipping point in that issue and, and that next year, at least for the European Union, DG Justice will bring forward proposals around mandatory due diligence, environmental due diligence and human rights due diligence, building what the French government's already done, etc., do you welcome this? I mean, do you think it's 
Is, is this a good legacy for all your work over those 22 years? Is this the direction of travel you wanted to see or, or, or do you think it's overly legalistic now? It's a kind question, but all of our work, you know, I've been proud to do what I what I've done, and we've had some great times. And uh, um, uh, you you recall that I led the establishment of a multi stakeholder forum yeah. at European level on these yeah. issues for the first time, and then the European Commission changed their definition, as you say, to say CSR was defined as a voluntary action, and all of the NGOs walked out of the forum <laughs> in two years. And I brokered it, and I got the Commission to rechange their definition. And the NGOs came back in, and then I, I was the first person to propose the non-financial reporting directive. Yeah. And at least six thousand companies across Europe are reporting on uh, environment, yeah. social, and explicitly human rights that weren't doing so before. Yeah. Uh, and had I died, and if I do die tomorrow, and they put that directive on my grave, I've always said that will be fine by me. I'm deeply proud of it. Um, but. Is, things are moving apace on man, man, mandatory human rights due diligence. Yeah. Many people watching this will be very familiar with those terms, but just to check everyone is, it's just the idea that companies don't have to just say that they respect human rights, but they have to have a process where they can analyse for themselves that they genuinely are doing it, and then they have to tell people about it to some degree. So that's what we're talking about here. Uh, and the, the whole principle of, of due diligence, of course, comes from the rugby work that you and I were both involved with, uh, the development of the guiding principles on business and human rights. But what we've seen, in spite of the European initiative, and I, even though I'm its, it was its originator and author um, uh, with many other people, uh, um, I'd be the first to say that it's imperfect and to want to see further development. And as regards to your question, of course it's the right thing to do. You know, we in, finan in the world of finance and financial reporting, Certain things have to happen because we recognise that fraud and corruption are worries within the system and then can have disproportionate impacts for investors and for others. And it's not even a debate about the fact that that's mandatory and how it's implemented is through standards that are largely drawn up through voluntary, voluntary means. So it's not an excessive mandatory approach. And I've simply argued over the years, and I feel this as strongly today as I've ever felt it, that there should be an equivalence in how companies are accountable for their financial performance with their wider, broader societal and environmental uh, performance, including specifically human rights. And I, I, so when we've seen, and I, I'm currently doing some work with a, 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 the Alliance for Corporate Transparency at the European level, we might come back to that, um, which has analysed, it's been the most credible organisation for surveying implementation of the directive, over a thousand companies surveyed, all on a public database this year. And what it shows is that companies are, do have policies on human rights, fantastic, but they don't identify risks. And if they do identify risks, then they don't actually identify what they do about them with outcomes. Right. And that's really poor. And as you, you know, you yourself personally are involved in the corporate human rights benchmark, where it's very clear that the leading companies are improving in their performance, that there is more awareness. But there's a large cadre of companies where there's no activity at all. Yeah. And it's only through mandatory action yeah. that will that will change. And the the fact that the European Commission has it, commissioner has indicated that he will support mandatory human rights due diligence. And of course it makes sense for that not just to be in France or potentially Switzerland, but across the whole of the European Union and ultimately across the, the, the whole of the world. I know people who say that there should be a, um, a convention in the OECD. Uh, maybe that is an argument on how this could be globalised. But of course that is the, uh, of course that, that is the right thing to do. What I... Can I just say one more thing, John. I think, I hope that I am we proved in the, in the non-financial reporting directive that you could get appropriate regulation that wasn't handcuffing, it wasn't burdensome, and that did actually take business with it. And all of the surveys of business, not of others, of business themselves, say that after it was implemented, that's what they feel. And I feel the same about mandatory human rights due diligence. At the moment, for some, it feels like a threat and an unknown. 
but when it's implemented, they will see that it's sensible and actually in terms of the long-term stability, certainty and performance of the company itself. No, I, I hope so too. And I remember when we launched the Corporate Human Rights Benchmark, uh, having um, um, things thrown at me by many friends yes. in business. Yes. yes. And now they're tugging my, my, my sleeve every time I see them saying, make sure the CHRB doesn't go away. We've yeah. invested so much. But political will... Uh, Richard, you know how scarce a commodity political will can be sometimes. I mean, we have rare earth metals, and then we have an even scarcer commodity political will. Um, what is it that will make the proposal next year in Brussels successful? And we're all aware, I think, that most of the business lobby groups in Brussels haven't changed their position on mandatory due diligence. It's the same as it was 10 years ago. But governments seem to have done, right? The German government in particular, but others, the French clearly, um, the UK is irrelevant, unfortunately, from this discussion now. But what, what has changed the political will of governments to regulate in this area when, when the business lobby groups themselves have not changed their positions, but as you say, leading, some leading companies have, but they're the front runners? What, what, what is it that's changed in, in, in the water, so to speak? Well, I think it remains to be seen whether the European Commission will follow through on their on their promises and DG Justice uh, which is a department of the European Commission again for non Brussels bubble people uh, you know they've been promising studies and so on for a long time and we've been working on them yeah I was still I was working on them as an MEP and that's now uh, four or five years ago when I stepped down um, so we'll see um, but I think the French are giving leadership and the French, again, on non-financial reporting, the French introduced their state law in 2001, and that was a, a very important a very important precursor of the work that I was able to do in the European Union as a whole. Um, and what we've seen is the Germans and the Dutch have uh, undertaken public commitments to assess implementation and said, you know, if it's not up to standard, then we will want to legislate. So I think, and these are very influential countries, and then the Finnish, when then they were in the presidency of the European Union last year, they really led this argument. And sometimes small countries can actually see more clearly the principle and less the vested self-interest. And, I, you know, I think they, they will go down in history as, as really marking a change in that. So I think it's a combination of different political factors across different countries. Uh, but in terms of the underlying circumstances, um, it's, it's now over 10 years. We had the 10 year anniversary of the guiding principles. Um, and uh, how many victims of human rights abuse connected with companies uh, and supply chains are actually better today and prevented from abuse and violation compared with 10 years ago? I think we struggle. I think we would struggle to answer that question i think there are i'm not a cynic i think there would be a, a, pl a positive answer to yeah. that and yeah. i think there are many in business who are completely credible and serious yeah. and authentic about this yeah. but it's not enough it's yeah. not enough no and i agree we, yeah please Sorry. no no i want to take us to the last to the sort of last bit here is that question of of have we failed i mean i'm thinking of the populist votes we see for Trump and Boris Johnson in the UK, um, but also Black Lives Matter this this very week. Um, mm. We were speaking to you at the beginning of June 2020, for those of you that are watching this in months to come. People on the streets, not just of US cities, but cities all over the world, including Europe, um, talking about inequalities, discrimination that goes back decades, if not hundreds of years. Um, there's a huge business component of this. There's, there's workplace discrimination, there's youth unemployment, you know, there's a lack of jobs coming out of this, huge inequality. And um, if we had been successful getting companies to live up to their social and environmental responsibilities, would we have not had less inequality? And perhaps would we not have seen the populism that we see in the world since the financial crisis? I mean, have we, in a sense, failed or have we just been playing at the margins of what's really needed? Well, I'm an optimist. I don't think we failed at all. And I think uh, um, uh, awareness, uh, reporting is a great example, but only one. Uh, 
is massively ahead than where we would have been 10 and 20 years ago. And it's been the work of the movement that's achieved that. And the easiest thing uh, is to be a cynic and simply to criticise. It's much harder to do something to make things better. And there are p the truth is that there are people inside business and outside business who share that view and we're working together uh, uh, and I've worked on both sides of the fence in order to try and realise those aims and I think anyone who retreats simply into the bunker and says it's all failed is undermining the attempts of the rest of us and I will never 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 be part of that and I think a key difference and this is where uh, business viewers of this podcast and by, uh, uh, by the way putting a date on it uh you know that those demonstrations it might be the 1960s as well as the 2020s <laughs> yeah. let for heaven's sake hope it's not 2013 2040 when people are watching this and it's happening again but there is a danger of it but i think for the business viewers who sort of again they're going to be a bit frightened by your question it's all our fault it's not saying that companies have caused these problems it's saying that we live in a world where there is an underclass, there are voiceless people, there are disenfranchised people, and in America and across many of developed countries, it's black and minority ethnic people who are just completely outside of the system and are alienated. And business hasn't, you know, you, you can argue from the days of slavery, but the idea that the cause of all of that is business is nonsense. And anyone who wants to suggest that, again, they're still in a bunker and they're still actually being unhelpful. But the idea that business can't be a major influence in changing and improving that is the one that we propound. Now, could they have done it further and faster and might that have helped in the situation we find this very day, literally, uh, in the wake of the George Floyd killing? You can argue and discuss that. But what I hope it does is reinvigorate uh, those within business in terms of the discrimination agenda. And in this current times, discrimination against uh, internationals of any kind uh, is a huge issue. Um, black and minority ethnic people are desperately more affected by COVID than anyone else. And so, of course, there are special considerations, as your own brilliant study showed. Um, the uh, extra um, uh, concerns about women who are working from home, doing two jobs, uh, as so many always do, but incredible extra burdens of childcare and domestic work alongside uh, employment considerations that ha have a big impact on uh, on business uh, and all of the other discriminations, if what this does is to get business people to think, again, outside that narrow health-driven, medicine-driven, crucial as it is, I'm here because of that, all right? So don't think I don't think that's important. But if business people can look at that and respect it and support it, but also make sure you and we look more broadly and think about the, the connectivity that there is. If we think about the supply chains, think about long-term as well as short-term, think about internationalism and not retreating to uh, markets, recognise that trade unions can be our allies in this situation, trade union membership having, having gone up, then actually the, some of the causes of the inequalities, which aren't business, but business can really tackle some of those causes and business won't do it on its own. Governments and politics do have their part to play, which is why I've been both sides of the fence. But let business unleash its creativity, its drive, its resources and how it can influence through its own business processes and model, which is what we argue to tackle those issues of discrimination as we argue that all issues of business and human rights should be respected. Now, you and me have argued a long time, I mean, that, that we think the world of business and the world of society are interlinked fundamentally. But we have at the moment the British government negotiating with the European Union on its trade deal. Um, and I'm not sure what's going on, but uh, we did see a common uh, French-Dutch paper of a couple of weeks ago and reports in the FT and elsewhere that seems to suggest that Europe wants there to be social and environmental conditions in the trade agreement and the UK is fighting most of those, wants a libertarian 
um, you know, sort of business, pure business uh, trade agreement. I find that incredible in the context of everything we've just talked about the past 40 minutes. Can you understand why the UK government is taking that position? And do you think it will be successful? I mean, where, where will we have a trade agreement by the end of this year? And will we see environmental and social issues firmly embedded in it? Or will they be in some appendix? Well, firstly, there's no doubt that the European social model is at the cornerstone of what the European Union is about. And uh, if you look at international negotiations, everything from the, the different agreements, the Paris Agreement, and I was there, uh, the emissions trading scheme and so on, that Europe has been the leader in terms of environmental protection in the world. Uh, and, you know, so that, there's no doubt about that. Um, and then the argument from a UK perspective to leave the European Union uh, was for many people on that side of the argument, particularly in politics, about saying that we can have the low road to prosperity, get rid of the environmental and social protections, reduce those costs for business, uh, and have a different model from the one that we've seen within the European Union, an anti-regulatory stance. And that was a deliberate political position of many of those who led. I'm not saying who voted for leave, but who led the arguments for leave. So we then shouldn't be very surprised if that's if where we're the kingdom government led by <laughs> some of the same people uh, um, takes that position. And, and the crucial thing for non-British watchers, before the British, the British general election last December, uh, the, it was in the political agreement between Britain and the European Union that social and environmental standards would not be retracted. And that was part of what was going to be legally agreed as part of the agreement between the UK and the EU. And then after the British general election, the newly elected British government deliberately took those out of the revised political agreement with the European Union. So th they signalled very clearly the, their intention in relation to that. Uh, and the European Union, and this is for the UK watchers, what, you know, why shouldn't they uh, try to protect their market and their businesses uh, by insisting that there is a, a minimum level playing field in terms of social environmental compliance and that they're not going to be undercut by more competitive companies who don't respect those basic minimum standards. So it's a, it's a perfectly proper, it's not an anti-British position, no. it's a perfectly proper position from the no. European Union to take. Now, the government in the UK has, also said, has always said, well, we won't legislate for it, but we mean it, right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think it is up for the world of politics, but also the world of all of us across society yeah. to hold... Has COVID, those Richard, British has COVID changed it? Account. Has COVID changed it, this centre? I mean, if it is still up for negotiation, in a sense. Um, I think the, government, the British government often talks about reasonable people. I've heard that, that off a few ministers' lips over recent weeks that... Um, interpreting the guidelines around COVID is we should all be reasonable. Um, will the government be reasonable? Is, is there something from the, the experience of the past few months that might actually lead decision makers to think that social issues are relevant <laughs> to trade? Um, or, or will it just be ignored? I mean, is, is there, will there be a COVID legacy in relation to our trade agreements? What I'm asking. Well, we often talk about looking at the Chinese government, you have to read coded phrases and actions to try and think out what they're really thinking and actually no one knows what this UK government's really thinking because no. Boris Johnson is someone who comes from a sort of liberal libertarian tradition within the British Conservative Party and he's taken sometimes quite liberal stances in re relation to migration for example and he's done that even since being oh, Prime oh. Minister. Yeah, as well. So yeah. you know those of us from the main whether you're centre-right, centre or centre-left, those of us from the outward-looking, uh, inclusive, um, moderate centre uh, across the spectrum are probably all hoping that he that really is true about him. But then he's got a, a principal advisor who's as far right as you can go. I nearly said a till of the hand, but I think that probably um, uh, would not be a uh, uh, reflect on me. But, you know, who's, 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 who's sort of... Gone, almost gone to death to to defend. So no one actually knows where the UK and it will will end up on that. And of course, it's nonsense. The idea that the the trade agreement should be struck by December when everyone's been 
dealing with the coronavirus crisis is nonsense. And so in any other situation, everyone will be saying we'll extend it a bit. But they're so hung up ideologically on getting uh, that this deadline respected that they're, they're willing probably to put their own country through any amount of devastation and damage in order to, to retain their political credentials within their own party so i'm i'm pretty gloomy about that as you can probably I can as tell. You can probably <laughs> uh see uh, but i've been you know i've had the privilege in my career of working in europe and yeah. then globally um on these issues and of yeah. course if we can create an international consensus behind these things then you know day-to-day -day politics in britain is, is going to be frankly um less important and will right. ultimately be part of the trend right. um, no, and in, for, yeah. for business watchers again you know there is no single national company now even small businesses uh are massively in international supply chains yes. um and so the idea that we can afford to let these different separate fragmented approaches develop is you know, against every business interest, you know, complying with different rules and regulations is hugely costly and much more costly than the environmental and social standards that we're talking about. And so those arguments ultimately must prevail. And many of us, and I'm sure you and me, John, will be continuously putting them. Absolutely. I'm just going to move on to the last question. But before I do, I want to thank our listeners for, for bearing with us and also uh, see if anyone uh, spotted the deliberate mistake uh, about the Mongolian embassy. I, of course, had Genghis Khan in my head when you were talking about Attila the Hun. Um, um, how I would get the two mixed up, I can't tell. But uh, um, uh, Right, final question, looking forward, Richard, and particularly on your work on reporting, right? Um, I want to know what your hopes are for the legacy around that, because you've really been at the forefront of transparency and reporting. And how do we convert that win? into a behavioral change because transparency doesn't itself in itself deliver change, right? It's, it's, a, it's an enabler to greater accountability, better behavior. So how do we build on what you've achieved on reporting and convert that into the kind of behavioral change we're looking for? Well, I accept by the way, the premise of your question. Uh, and I think we, where just in the same way that we move from voluntary CSR and philanthropy to understanding that this must be about the business understanding its impacts, positive and negative, of, of the business itself and managing those to maximise uh, positives and to minimise the negatives. And that's essentially what we did, whether you call that CSR still or not. You know, that was still a major step forward. And I think we won that argument. It's certainly amongst the the many in, in advanced and developed economies in the West and the North uh, of the world. But I think in the same way, what we've done is to create, certainly uh, amongst the, the, uh, the, top, the top companies in the US, in Europe, you know, we're now talking about 75% in market capital terms who do sustainability or non-financial or integrated reporting in one form or another. And it's bringing information into the public sphere and it is being used by people and society and investors. It is being used and it, it's, start, it's a ball that is rolling and rolling. And I think, you know, we definitely have achieved a huge amount there and we want to push the ball a bit further. But the, the key point that where I absolutely want to agree with you is that the link between the reporting and corporate governance, whether it's truly owned by the board, whether it's truly part of the culture of the company and the work that's going on at the moment that says you can do whatever you want with the rules and regulations, but if you don't change the culture, you don't change anything. And then, and this is particularly my work on integrated reporting and non-financial reporting, the, the link between the reporting business strategy and business model not that the strategy and the model aren't in the report. Of course, they should be, and in many cases, they're not. And we've been working on that, and we're making ground. But the, the reporting should lead to changes in business behaviour yeah. and equally be part, put into the business strategy and into the business model. And there's been some wonderful work that I've been proud to be associated with on integrated thinking. It's, yeah. it's one of the sexy things. Uh, and 
many people in business get that and where we could get when i was at the irc where we could get businesses interested in integrated reporting sometimes there was a hesitation but you talk to them about integrated thinking and they got it because they got they got the necessity to embrace this new world yeah. of globalization digitalization climate and social developments and i think that will be the challenge in the in the next period uh, and ultimately and you talked about legacy ultimately none of us have been born and worked through our careers for better reporting probably there's a few people in the accountancy profession sorry right yeah. but we've been <laughs> born we've now, worked in we've been in movements we've <laughs> been active to make things better they Correct. actually <laughs> impacts upon behavior yes and <laughs> we've been gains but yeah. we need to measure them more. We yeah. need to measure them against the goals in terms of equalities, international development, climate change. Yeah. And that's going to be the, I think, the big challenge of the next period. And I think there are many business leaders who are up for that. The whole issues about purpose in business are very, very current and I think correct. And we're all going to be working on those issues in the years ahead. And you look forward to it and I look forward to it and it's oh, the damn right thing to do. Richard, I really hope so. And it's so good to see you so well and back with us. Um, you. We need you <laughs> for the fight ahead. Uh, Richard Howitt, uh, thank you very much. And to everybody who's listened, um, you can learn more about some of the issues we've talked about by going to www.ihrb.org. But until the next time, thanks for joining us. Thank you.